So again, welcome to week four of Civics 101. Uh, this is the final week for this course, so we appreciate all of you joining us. Brianna, we especially appreciate you taking the time to come in and, um, and have the conversation and discussion with us here in the class. So thank you very much. And with that, I will turn things over to you. Thank you all. Um, sorry, my voice is a little coarse. Not from the election, I just have a slight cold. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I hope everyone has an opportunity to vote on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a really well timed class because we can talk a little bit about that. But what I wanted to talk about in this last part of this four session um, run is really about how. It is people that make elections run. Um, you know, we've talked about all the administrative aspects of things, and we've talked about all the different processes that are involved. But at the end of the day, this is an exclusively human-run event, and without people, we can't actually have a democracy. So before, uh, when we first started this class, I showed this uh, really overwhelming graphic of all of the different parts of the election administration process from the day that the election is called all the way down to certification. Uh, and so in the, the following classes, we have covered voter registration. We have covered absentee voting. We have covered ballots. And we covered voting equipment. But what we didn't talk about are the parts that people are mostly involved in. And there are people involved in those other processes, too. We talked about proofing ballots and ordering them. We talked about voter education and our absentee ballots and things like that. Uh, but the um, main thing that I want to talk about today is the election judges, election day, and polling place experience for things. So the first part of that process is talking about participation. We need participation for elections to be successful. Our election judges are the heart of the polling place. They ensure voters can vote and they maintain the integrity of the election. So I know that we have several poll workers in here and I am very thankful for them. And uh, in the election that just happened on Tuesday, we had over 200 election judges and then also youth participants. So we don't just have election judges serving at these polling locations. We bring high school students in too, to teach them about the process so that when they turn 18, they can become election judges, but also so that it removes some of the uh, mystery of the voting process. Uh, we've been going into high schools for a while, doing mock elections and talking to people about how uh, you know, they can register to vote and things like that when they get to be 17 and a half. But you can still see kind of the apprehension of, well, this is a government sanctioned thing, so I don't want to do anything wrong. I want to fill out my form correctly. I don't want to get in trouble for doing it the wrong way. I don't feel experienced yet. Uh, the best things that I have overheard when I've been at like mock elections for high school has been. Like, once they got the ballot and they voted, they were like, I feel so adult. Like, I feel really grown up. <laughs> and, and that is great. Like, that should be a part of adulthood, is getting to participate in democracy. So our election judges help make sure that that actually happens on election day. Uh, if we don't have people actually staffing the polling locations to check voters in and make sure that nothing goes wrong and issue the ballots, then a voter can't actually vote on election day. So um, it is a role in our office that we have an election judge manager, and her job is to do all of those assignments for the poll workers, make sure that everybody gets trained, and make sure that everybody has what they need all throughout election day. So she gets the calls along with my warehouse manager when there is a situation where they need more pens. Sometimes, sometimes people walk off with pens and they need more pens. Sometimes we may have forgotten to put in a pair of scissors and they want scissors for cutting the I voted stickers. That's, those are the things that we do on election day to make sure that the election judges themselves are supported. Because uh, that's really what our office's role is on election day, is to help voters at call, but really it's to make sure everything's going well at polling locations. So we have on uh, our website, and this is if you have not been a poll worker before, an election judge, which are interchangeable terms, um, 
Every year we have over 600 dedicated election judges. Most of them are return election judges. So we do add to our you know, roster of people that want to work as election judges, but most are repeat. Uh, we have people that have been working in elections in Boone County for over 40 years. Um, and uh, they help every election. They help manage polling places and assist voters. And the qualifications for being a poll worker, for being an election judge, are pretty easy for voters to obtain. So you, you have to be over 18, obviously. So as long as you're over 18 and you're a registered voter in Missouri, uh, we did one of the things that we, as a clerk association, successfully got into the law in 2022 was that previously you had to be registered only in the county that you were going to be an election judge in. And it is, it's not a secret, like the uh, Elections Assistance Commission created a civic holiday called National Poll Worker Day because we have shortages of poll workers. So uh, we successfully convinced people like, hey, uh, in the legislature, it's hard for us to find enough poll workers. Would you mind if we broadened that to as long as you're registered to vote somewhere in Missouri? And they agreed and said, yeah, it's worth it. If you've got somebody that lives in Callaway, but they're not needed as an election judge, go on and come into Boone County and you can serve as an election judge here. Uh, we don't have very many people that do that just because the day, I think because the day starts so early, it's hard to actually want to drive 45 minutes and then be at a polls all day and then drive 45 minutes home. Um, but there have been instances, uh, St. Louis County has my favorite story of it, where they had somebody from the middle of Missouri, not from Boone County, but I think somewhere north, uh, that said, you know, I've always been interested in how St. Louis County runs elections. I'll get a hotel and I'll stay overnight. So I'm there first thing in the morning. Can I work the poll there? And they said, yeah, absolutely. We'd love to have you. So that is always a possibility. Um, and the bipartisan nature of serving as an election judge makes this all the more important because here, we always need more Republican judges. That's our like main need to fill is Republican judges. But in our surrounding counties, they need Democratic judges. So we always have a list of several hundred people that we would love to work at the polls that are trained and ready to work, but they're all Democrats and we can't use them because we've already filled up our quota for the Democrats that we need. So those folks could go to Montauk or Cole or Callaway and go work as an election judge there, and that would be perfectly fine. Uh, they would probably welcome that quite a bit because they don't have enough Democrats in most situations to, in the same way that we don't have enough Republicans. Um, we also do like to have people that are used to technology, which has been easier to get by because nearly everybody has a smartphone. And the technology that we use at our polling places are iPads. So if you're used to using an iPhone or an iPad, it's not that scary to just use the iPad to check in voters. Um, so that's been a really good progression. Um, previously, I, I was not here to be an election judge when this happened, but in uh, 2014, 2016, we were using laptops to check in voters. And that process also required um, not just the laptop, but they actually had to set up servers at the polls. So um, that involved setting up three laptops and then a separate laptop server, connecting all of them together and then plugging them in. And every polling place had to do that. So the election judges had to do all of that process, um, which to me sounds incredibly overwhelming. And I'm very happy that all we have now are poll pads because you just plug them into power and they're on. And that's it. Uh, and the other thing that a lot of people don't realize about being an election judge is that you do get paid. It's a compensated position. So we call them volunteers because you are, you know, being a civic volunteer to participate at polling locations. But we pay. Um, the starting pay is $170 for the day. But if you're a supervisor, which means that you have some additional responsibilities, then um, starting pay is 200 And then you get additional pay for things like going to the training, um, setting up the polling place. Our election judges set up polling places on the Monday before the election. So it truly is, when they say that it is a team effort and requires people to actually work, 
this is why. We, as a staff of between six and nine people in the office, do not have the ability by ourselves to set up 43 polling locations all over Boone County. Uh, it really is a team effort. So if you've ever been interested in being one and haven't been one before, this is on our website and at the bottom of the page, if you scroll down, there's an application to serve as a poll worker. And we still do have the August and November elections, so we will be recruiting as many people as possible to work those. Anyone have any questions about poll worker stuff on election day? Yes. Can an independent be a poll worker? Yes, that's a great question. An independent can be a poll worker. Um, we have the two supervisors need to be of a major political party, so your supervisor, Republican or Democrat. But we have plenty of independent party um, affiliated election judges that work. So uh, if that has if that has been the thing to stop you, you can still be an independent judge. That's totally fine. You just can't be a supervisor. When I saw my uh, election judges at the most recent election, they had on t-shirts that said election judge. Yes. And I commented about that, and I told them that Osher had this class that you were teaching, and so now I appreciated even more <laughs> what those people were doing that day, and they were very pleased. We did. That was, um, I think I mentioned in some other classes, like how much we all steal from each other in the election community. And one of those things was the t-shirts because there were, uh, I can't remember which county it was that was telling me about it. There's a smaller county, might have been Osage County, that was saying that they got t-shirts for everybody and the voters really appreciated it because then they knew who to go to at the poll. Um, so we did this for this year, uh, invest in t-shirts for all the election judges. And were they comfortable? I hope Oh, yes. Okay. Great good. color, good yeah. fit. Nice material. <laughs> okay. Fashion statement. It was a, like a deep purple. Purple. Yeah. Of course. Purple. Oh, then it, oh, that's we went with bipartisan royal purple. purple. <laughs> yes. Also, you know, because election judges are also royal. And so <laughs> yeah, we went with purple. Um, and somebody, and this is a great question too. Somebody in the chat asked Are poll workers required to be there the entire time from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m.? Um, yes, that is the that is like the baseline. What we have started doing in order to encourage more people to work at the polls, and this doesn't apply to supervisors, but if you were going to be an independent, for example, and you had another friend that said that they were an independent, you could split the shift. So we have offered split shifts for people. You have to come with your partner. So you have to say, like, I'm going to be this, and I'll be the Republican, and then we'll this other person will come in, and they'll be the Republican and they split at noon. So we've had, uh, I think, three teams that we've had in, the, in this April election that did that. And that's gone over well. The feedback we got from people working at the polls is that it's nice to have some like fresh eyes in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that we can't do is uh, accommodate if somebody comes in and says, I want to do a split shift, but I don't have anybody to do it with. We can't match you up because we do only have one election judge manager. And so we, I know we get more interest in that, but we just don't have the capacity right now to accommodate. But it is an option. So these are the other things that our election judges do, aside from working in a polling place that make sure that the election happens. So training judges. Our election judges all go through a training process um, before usually the first election of the year, and then we'll have some refreshers that we offer. But we use between eight and 10 long time serving election judges to serve as trainers. So they get promoted and they become our training judges. And that way we can offer way more sessions uh, than if we were just doing those trainings ourselves. Me and the election judge manager do the supervisor trainings. Uh, but the poll worker trainings, the general election judge trainings, are all conducted by really long time, very experienced election judges. So if you worked for a long time and you were a previous teacher, for example, and you would want to get involved in that process, you're, you basically are temp staff at that point. So you get paid and everything because you're hired by your office. But that's something that we use election judges for. 
Um, testing equipment, so those bipartisan teams that we use when we do uh, testing to make sure that everything is counting correctly, we use election judges for that because they have experience with the process. Absentee processing, same thing. Uh, generally, for testing equipment and absentee processing and things like that, those are election judges that have served a long time that say, I really can't do the full day anymore. I'd, re I'd much rather do an eight to five type job. Testing and absentee processing happens between eight and five. It's just normal workday hours. So um, it's kind of like a, a nice, you've arrived, you don't have to be at the poll anymore. You could be a testing judge or a, an absentee processor judge. And then occasionally we will use them for signature checking. If we get uh, initiative petitions from the Secretary of State's office. So I'm sure most of you have been asked by somebody somewhere on the street to sign a petition. There's a lot of circulators out right now. When those circulated petitions get submitted to the Secretary of State's office, the Secretary of State's office has the choice to send the, the signatures relevant to a particular county to the county clerk's office for processing. And so if the Secretary of State's office chooses for the upcoming election uh, to send those signatures to us, we have to check thousands of signatures in a very short amount of time. So we will bring in temporary workers. Many times they'll be election judges because uh, the other nice thing about being an election judge is then you're on our radar and we can send out an email to people and say, hey, you know how you've been an election judge? How would you feel about taking a few hours and spending time in our office to do some work for us? So um, we, we have that. That happens in the summertime. We haven't had to do it in a while. I'm, I'm thinking we might have to do it for this upcoming election because uh, I'm hearing we're going to have four or five different petitions. So that will be fun. And then um, the, the last thing that election judges do is uh, the certification of the election itself. So for the April election, for example, we are going to be certifying on Friday afternoon, tomorrow afternoon. So we'll have a set of election judges that come in to do the full certification process. And that involves um, counting all the provisional ballots. We had 40 provisional ballots that were cast uh, on Tuesday. Any of the absentee ballots that we got before 7 p.m., but maybe we got like right before 7 p.m., so we didn't have a chance to count them yet. They'll take care of those. And then any of the military absentee ballots that come in by noon on Friday, those can be counted. And then the last thing that they do is the hand count audit. So that's a really important part of the process. We take a randomly selected 5% of our total precincts, so that's three for this election, and they will count all of the ballots by hand for those three polling locations to make sure that the um, tabulators did their job and everything that they were supposed to do. And the other thing they do is the write-in adjudication, which is very important for this election because we had three offices all throughout Boone County that are elected exclusively by write-in this time. So Ashland, so right now, if we're just talking about this current election, there is a ward race in Ashland that nobody knows who won yet because our certification team hasn't come in. Uh, there's a school board race in Sturgeon that nobody knows who won yet. And then the whole Hartsburg Board of Trustees, they don't know who won yet because we do all that during the certification process. So election judges are really important for that. Those are all things that can't be done just by using a computer. They have to be done with people doing them. Have those always been the Friday after the election? Usually they're done, the, like, they have to be done within two weeks of the election. Usually we wait until another week uh, with as many write-ins that we had that we knew, like, they're waiting on us to tell them what the answers are. We moved it up to the... Um, Friday at noon is the first opportunity that we have to certify because we have to wait for the military ballots to be back. So we're doing it as early as we possibly can um, just to make sure that uh, everybody is ready to go. Next, Generally with the April election, what happens is that everybody calls and says, I want to swear in my new uh, school board members. I want to swear in my new ward people. When are you certifying? Because I want to do that on Monday. And there's a bunch of people that are going to get sworn into their offices on Monday, so we should probably have the certification done by then. Sometimes they swear people in without us being certified yet. 
Uh, but usually those are cases where the margins are so big, they know that there's not going to be an issue. But we had some very close races. Um, one of the Hallsville ward races is within one vote. So if there is something in one of those provisional ballots or absentee ballots, it could change the outcome of the election. Um, we didn't have any ties this time, which is great. <laughs> uh, but if that were the case, then we'd be dealing with the tie during the certification process too. So uh, when we did have that Ward 3 tie, we moved up certification for that too so that we could get that taken care of. So everybody's got kind of a different timetable. Some counties will wait longer, some will do it earlier. Um, as long as it's within that two weeks, then it's fine. So, so when you said something about that you had some that had no, that had only write-in, that yeah. meant that nobody got on the on the ballot? Correct, yes. So um, for the people that are on the screen, she was asking if nobody got on the ballot, if that is uh, how the write-ins get elected. Yes, if you have nobody file, which is becoming more and more common. Um, I actually talked to several county clerks who said that they had a record number of write-ins because people didn't file. There is some, um, actually, I think one of the theories is that our certification, our filing deadlines fell on Christmas Eve this year. And so I think a lot of people just literally missed the filing deadline. And so they didn't have an opportunity to file, and that is why we ended up having so many write-ins. But like the village of Hartsburg, that is a long-standing tradition that nobody files to be on the ballot. They just do write-in only. I noticed on a ballot to, to write in it said must be a certified yes. write-in or something. So that happens after the write-in is cast, or no? So the certified write-ins are. So you got you have two categories of write-in. You have if nobody files at all, then anybody that gets written in is valid. Okay. And then you've got if somebody files for the office, but somebody else wants to be a write-in to be a contender, then they have to come into my office and fill out a declaration of intent to be a write-in. And that is what certifies them. So as long as we have paperwork, we only had one certified write-in for this whole election. It was for the second board. I've never noticed that before. So. Yep. Yes. What happens if you have <clears throat> where nobody files and they just write in and say they there's 10 people that write in Dave's name, but Dave doesn't want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> that happens. That, that does happen. <laughs> then, then what? So that does happen. Uh, it sort of is happening in real time right now, um, <laughs> where there are people that have, have said, I, if I win this, I do not want it. Um, it's the same whether they get written in and get it or they actually win. Uh, like there have been situations where somebody has won and then said, like, never mind, I don't actually want this position. Uh, it creates a vacancy. And that vacancy then gets filled by, you, usually, if it's a city, for example, then the city board of aldermen, the mayor, fill the vacancy until the next municipal election. So it does happen. Um, I don't think it happens much in Hartsburg because they're used to it. Like they, they plan, which for the first time, I, I was surprised because when they send stuff to us, they just say, nobody files and that's the end of it. I was reading the Ashland paper like three weeks before the election and they have this little note, like throwaway line in this article that just said, uh, this person and this person are asking people to write in their names for Hartsburg. And I was like, so they do campaign. I guess they do campaign. They just don't put their name on anything. How do you notify all the voters? Of the write-ins? Mm -hmm. So we can't. That's the really interesting thing about write-ins is even if they're certified, even if they file the declaration of intent, our office is not allowed to publish their name anywhere because it would be considered electioneering. So if somebody wow. withdraws, uh, the voter really wouldn't know that. No, um, that, is, that is one of the trickiest parts about it is so much of like what is on the ballot depends on whether the candidate themselves can get the word out about it. So um, I think 
The second ward in Columbia was a really good example because the person that wanted to be a certified, certified write-in, um, we couldn't put their name anywhere. And he went to a bunch of different uh, forums and he was in the newspaper and he you know, had all the questionnaires filled out and all of that. Uh, but very, very few people wrote his name in. I think probably because they were expecting to just see his name somewhere and didn't realize that they would have to be the ones that write it in. And it's really hard because you can't, we can't, even though it's like general voter education to talk about write-ins, in theory, we can't say, oh, don't forget that there's a write-in option for you for second ward because that would be advocating for the writing candidate. I had wondered about that um, because I saw in it that somewhere it said there is no certified write-in and I kept thinking, what about that third person? And it's, I, I understand now that I thought maybe they had said, oh, never mind, I've changed my mind. I don't, don't want to do it. And so you're saying it's because they, they just weren't certified. So that it was true. There are no certified write-ins. Yeah. But there was a write-in if yeah, somebody there, wanted it. Yeah, there, there are still situations, I think, where um, people aren't exactly sure like how the write-in process works. And so I get a lot of questions from cities and school boards that want to know how to handle the write-ins, too, because uh, there's a whole listing in the code of state regulations about how to count a writing candidate because you're going to have people spell names wrong and you know not exactly know how to like some people know somebody as chuck and, and for other people they're chaz and another person knows them as chase like are those all the same three people i don't know um so what we do is we write all of the names down and then we send it to whatever the district is and we say, you figure out. <laughs> and they give them. So like Hartsburg, we don't say, oh, we know, like Bruce Begman is, is an example of one of the people that's on their board. Bruce Begman's name is kind of hard to spell. Um, sometimes we see it with two N's and sometimes we see it with one N. We write them all down. So the list, when you look at Hartsburg's election results, ends up having like 12 names. Yeah, 12 names when really it's only three people. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's that's a very common thing that happens with write-ins too. So, so you said you can't you can't advertise on either the ones that are officially certified for a write-in, nor can you mention any ones. The, well, then they're obviously the ones that are just a, yes, correct. Yeah, we can't do anything can't about write -ins. Nope. Any more questions about write-ins? I could talk about write-ins all day long. <laughs> So uh, that post-election audit that's going to happen, this is what it looks like. This is a picture of it happening in real time. Those are two of our election judges. Uh, and they account for everything. Uh, like I said, they do all the provisional ballot adjudication, the military and overseas and write-ins. Um, and then they do their count. And so that there is a picture of the count. And I'm talking to them about something. But uh, it'd be, the hand count process is long, takes all day. Um, for major elections, we do bring in more than one team. So we don't make one team do all of it <laughs> because it would take weeks. So um, I think for November of 2020, we had eight teams, eight or nine teams of election judges that came in to help us do the, the hand count part. Yes? What is the average number of people assigned to each polling place? Um, so we try to, like number of voters, yeah, we try to keep the overall turnout number to be a thousand or less. But what that means is that sometimes if it is a very active poll and we know that there's very high turnout, that means that only 2,000 people are assigned there because 50% of them may turn out versus uh, we have some where 6,000 people are assigned there, but the majority of them are students and we know they're not going to vote in the April election. And so that, that poll may only have 750 people that show up at it. So we try to, what we're trying to do is keep it at the numbers, which is exactly why we balloon up our numbers in November, because we know the turnout's going to be higher. Uh, and 1,000 voters tends to be a pretty good steady 
NIST for a polling place without having to have lines. Any other questions? So the most important participate in the whole process is you, the voter. You can't do any of this without voters showing up. Um, and so this last part, I think, is going to generate some discussion and and hopefully enough of it because I'm trying to make sure that we end on like a positive note of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> so you get a good, good yeah. <laughs> uh, so the. Um, the voter turnout numbers, they're not the positive part of happiness. Voter turnout numbers for April are generally pretty not great. So what I have done is put them in two different formats because I think they impact people very differently depending on how you say them. For the April 2024 election, we had about 16% turnout. But what that means is that 83% of our registered voters didn't vote. So that's not a voter registration issue, that's a turnout issue once people have already gotten registered. Um, and I think people start to think like, oh, August, those are primaries, people really care about those. Well, even in those, we don't crack 30% usually in an August election. And those are really important in a lot of situations because uh, especially with the way that we have our districts and um, in some cases our counties, where one party may be the only one that filed for that election. There may be no other uh, opponent. In some cases, it may be just the Republicans. In some cases, it's the Democrats. The primary is where the person actually wins the election. So uh, those are more important than I think people think about. Um, so 16% of the people decided all of the Yes. Wow. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it too. Sixteen percent of the registered voters that made all the decisions. That's horrible for city council, for school board, for everything. Um, and somebody had asked me uh, on election night, like, "Well, okay," because I estimated nineteen percent. Is that nineteen percent was fair? You look at those numbers. Nineteen percent seems like it would be pretty good. Uh, our last election that was most comparable to April twenty three was April 21, because most of these are three-year terms. If you're on city council, it's a three-year term. So the same races that were on the ballot this year were on the ballot in 21. Um, sometimes the races are more contentious, and so that draws more people out. But in 21, the second ward was wide open. Um, the sixth ward, I can't remember if Betsy had an opponent or not, but it was the same person. Um, and there was 13% of people that turned out for that election. So we're technically better than we were the last time all these races were on the ballot. But then you look at 22 and 23. One of those is a mayoral race for the city of Columbia, so they all had a lot of interest in what was happening. But even with that, we still didn't even crack 25%. So April elections is why I always tell people that if they're going to vote in any election and they really want their vote to count, April's the one to do it in. There's not that many other people you're contending against, and it's the highest likelihood there's going to be a tie or a very, very close race, and your vote will make the difference in pushing somebody over or making sure somebody doesn't get in. So um, even though not a lot of people turn out, those are really important elections. Um, and then, like I said, for August, even looking, I put the, the 2020 numbers on there just for comparison because we don't know what August turnout will be for this year. But if 2020 was comparable to it, and granted we were in COVID and so it was a whole different situation, but we still had a lot of people that wanted to vote in August. We didn't crack 30%. So I'll be very curious as we get closer to August and we know what's on the ballot, which won't be finalized until the end of May, if we can crack 30 for the August election. These are Boone County numbers? These are Boone County numbers. I, I'm probably gonna get in trouble for saying this, but the importance of the August election particularly on our statewide offices, mm -hmm. even though we, regardless of what political party we're in, probably the attorney general, the governor, the lieutenant governor are gonna be Republicans on a statewide basis. So it's really important. Mm -hmm. I, and 
I can say that, can I? I you I you can say it, not me. <laughs> but it's just critical that we actually participate in the election process mm -hmm. in, an, in an election that really doesn't draw a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. yeah. And and I, likewise for city council elections. Yeah, I think that's a great point. But a person could be conflicted because there may be some of the elections that you that's true. Because you you have to uh, you have to go by party party, and if I think you've got a very valid point on picking if it turns out that one party has pretty much all the statewide, which may have some local ones that you're interested in, and if you are if you're not a Republican, that's and, called a conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> On these um, elections for April, <coughs> August, and November, I know April had write-ins. All of the other ones, are there write-ins or does it have to be a special reason to have write-ins? There can be write-ins for all of them. Well, okay. Um, it usually, because usually the size of the office, like the, the actual number of voters in the district is bigger, so like state representative, it's harder to be a writing candidate for state representative because you're kind of pushing up against a, more campaign funds and trying to get people's attention when they're focused on other things. So we don't see write-ins as often. But no, I, I didn't mean um, for serious. I just, oh, just in general. people, sometimes people don't like either one. Yes. So they just stay home, but you can just write in. Yeah, you can. You can just write in for anything. Um, where we do see more, uh, where it does come up more often is in August and November, we might see, well, not August, but, it can't happen, but in November, independent candidates. So there's an avenue for people to get on the ballot without having to be a party candidate. It involves circulating petitions, and that takes an effort to do that. You can feel you've done your civil duty yes. knowing that your vote isn't going to win, but at least you cast a vote. You didn't just sit on your hand. That's true. <laughs> yes. Is there, I don't know if you have any way of you know looking at this but is there any demographic difference between you know like do certain age groups more likely to vote in the april election that is a great question and i apologize to the people on the screen because uh i didn't repeat the last couple of ones but we were generally talking about the how august has party um you have to pick a party uh, and then also write in so this question is about demographics of the turnout. We don't, in our voter registration data, have anything other than age. And so, well, I could break it down on age. Generally, um, age in Boone County gets a little out of proportion because of the number of college students. And so uh, a basic rule of thumb is that we don't see college students coming out in April or in August because school is not in session. Um, in August and in April, they're not always as um, tuned into what's going on at the local level. So you definitely see a much higher percentage of younger voters coming out in the November elections for that reason. Uh, but I think that also accounts a little bit for the difference between the November 2020 and November 2022 election, because when president's not on the ballot, it's the younger voters usually that are not turning out. So we didn't even hit 50% of our registered voter turnout in November of 2022, even though that was an important election as well. How do you know? I mean, no, you don't give your age on the vote. Is it just anecdotal from the poll um, workers? No. So what we do have is everybody gets voter credit. So if you go to vote, yes. you get marked as voted. And that goes on your voter record forever. Not how you vote, it's oh, just that you vote. Okay. Yes. Right. So we can we right. can see how many people voted and we can run numbers on that. And okay. um so I I've done that in the past for um for planning purposes. It's actually very helpful. Um it helped us for planning how we were gonna handle the blue provisional ballots. Mm -hmm. So trying to estimate who the people were and where they lived that were going to be casting blue provisional ballots so that we could send out enough of them. And then also for absentee voting, uh, because there are some demographics that are more interested in doing uh, no excuse absentee voting. And so it makes it easier to help plan 
how many people are going to come out at a polling location, because if you get more people voting absentee, fewer will show up at the polls, so then we can kind of guess how many people we're going to expect to see on election day. Does um, that also affect your future polling places, where they are, and how many you have, if you look at, at where the bigger amounts of voters were? Um, yeah, so the question is about, does that help in predicting polling places and choosing polling places? I would, I would say, in a perfect world, yes, it would. <laughs> but nine times out of ten, where our polling places are, are more set by people that are willing to be polling locations. Yeah. Because, uh, like for this election in particular, Grace Bible Church was a perfect example. We had to send people to Grace Bible Church that had never voted there because we had another location that kicked us out and said, we, you can't use this as a polling place anymore. And the next closest place was Grace Bible. Uh, and so those are things that, as much as I'd love to make them based on how I know people are going to behave, which would be the best way to do it, sometimes we are in a beggars can't be choosers situation. Yes. Are there any regulations as far as polling locations, you know, whether it's a church, a school, a business, a whatever? So surprisingly, there are not. Um, regulations regarding polling places. We are kind of an outlier when it comes to state law because other other states have very stringent requirements about like even how many people can be assigned to a poll. In some states, only like they say 2,000 registered voters assigned to this poll only. You can't do any more than that. We don't have any requirements for any of those things and we don't have any requirements on polling places the only thing that really is kind of a, a helpful regulation for us, although in practice it doesn't turn out that great if you really want to do this, is that every publicly owned building can be, for lack of a better word, commandeered by the county clerk's office to be a building. <laughs> it's, it's not always great for relationship building. <laughs> And I don't think that CPS would take it very kindly if I walked into their office and said, you're going to give me polling locations. <laughs> so there have been like deals that have been helpful to make sure that we could keep the polling locations and stuff. And CPS, for example, closed the schools in the November elections now, specifically so that we can use the, po the polling places. Um, because otherwise, we can't use schools as polling locations because they're too locked down. Yeah. I've never thought of what you're describing there. Uh, you, potentially, you could go to your polling place and if you, if you don't follow your email or whatever, and it's not open. So you, it, it might have been closed. Can you always go down to the city? Can you always go to the annex and vote? Yes. Yeah, so um, that's a great question about like if your polling location changes, are there ones that never change? We have three central polls in Boone County for that reason. One is the Boone County Government Center. So if you're downtown, you can always vote there. If you end up downtown and you're like, I don't think I'm going to make it home in time and I want to vote, you can go to the government center. Friendship uh, Baptist Church, which is north of town, uh, that is one of our central polls. So if you're in that area. And then um, Woodcrest Chapel Church, south of town, serves as a central poll. So those are helpful not just for if we have a polling place closed, but also if we have an emergency on election day. So last April... Um, there was an incident at Forum Boulevard uh, Church, which was serving as a polling location down the street from Woodcrest. And it was a law enforcement issue. There was a person that was doing something, I don't know, slashing tires. Unclear. Everything went on lockdown in the area. And so that poll got locked down. And so we put out press releases and let people know, hey, don't go to your poll right now, but if you're planning to vote at this particular moment, just keep going down the road and you'll end up at Woodcrest and you can vote there. So um, the central polls help for if a polling place closes before election day and you know voters don't necessarily know about it because they haven't looked at their sample ballot, but also on election day if we have a situation. Can I just want to make sure, if, are you having questions from the online audience at all? I have had a couple. Okay, and you you can see them and everything. Yes. Okay. They show up. Okay. Thank you. So, and I'll answer this question really quick. It's not related to the poll workers or to the polling place stuff, but the five percent of precincts because that's a good question. 
5% of precinct hand count is done during the certification process. The random numbers are drawn by uh, election judges as well. So that's how they get to the 5% randomly drawn. Um, and it's a public process, which I don't think that I emphasized enough before. We have to post that um, like a public notice that is going to happen. People can come and observe it. They can watch it. They can ask questions. It occurs in the government center in the, uh, in the we call it the counting room, but it's a room with all glass windows where the judges sit and there's a conference table in the middle of it and they count all the ballots. And so you can stand there and ask questions all day long and um, look at it and it's real boring <laughs> watching people count things, but it's a good education for all the different parts of the process that we do to make sure that everything is working properly. Any other questions about those? Okay. So this is the kind of the last thing that I had, which is why I said we could keep talking because I'm going to run out of things to talk about. <laughs> uh, these are possible ways to increase engagement. I'm going to preface it by saying I'm not endorsing any of these things. Nobody's endorsing any of these things. These are just things that people have brought up in studies and um, a lot of campaigns, actually. Because campaigns, just as much as elections administrators, want to know how to increase turnout. So they study it a lot. One of those is same-day voter registration. Uh, the thought is that we have these deadlines to register to vote in Missouri. It is four weeks before election day if you're a new voter. In some cases, it's even more than that. In some cases, there are different requirements about residency. Uh, but for the states that have same-day voter registration, they do see a boost in their turnout because people don't have to worry about whether they're registered or not. They can just show up and take care of it. And the argument uh, is kind of that we've moved so far in technology and in uh, being able to communicate with other offices, that it's not the end of the world if somebody registers to vote in a specific location because we can track to make sure that they're not also registered somewhere else. That's especially true for Missouri, but um, the states that have same-day voter registration have a much different way of mitigating things and making sure that all the processes have integrity. Uh, it would require a pretty big lift to make that change in Missouri. Um, increasing voter options, which really just means just having them more than Election Day. It's kind of split as to whether early voting increases turnout or not. It increases convenience. There are more people that vote early. But I always caution people that looking at just the numbers of early voters to predict whether somebody's going to have a high turnout election or not is not a great way of trying to figure out if there are going to be a ton of people showing up on Election Day. Because it may be that they've just all chosen a more convenient option, and then not very many people show up at the polls. We saw that. I think COVID was actually a great example of that because we had so many options that 30% of the people that wanted to vote voted. And if we had just looked at how many had done voting before Election Day and extrapolated, we would have hit like 99% turnout. And Obviously, we had 70% turnout, and it was because people just shifted when they were going to vote, not chose to vote. So um, those are things I'm including in that, like mail-in voting, To A lot of the states that have exclusively mail-in voting or just like more mail-in voting see higher turnout. And that's another convenience thing. Like you've got the ballot mailed to you, and it's sitting there, and you have time to research and do everything you want to do, then... Uh, the only thing you have to do at the end of it is drop it back in the mail. That tends to like allow people to, to increase their participation rate because there's fewer barriers um, than having to go to a polling place or something. They can vote from home. Do the mail-in ballot states like Oregon, who only use that, do they have a better turnout? Yes. So the question was, do the, to the states that have just mail in like Oregon and Washington have higher turnout. Yes, they do. Um, why don't we do that? Then? <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of reasons why we don't do exclusively mail in voting. Um, the processes are very, very different. And so we would have to kind of overhaul how we do things. And then there's a the whole political discussion of 
mail in voting. Yeah, and the um the states that are now kind of increasing in their voter turnout that are almost overtaking Oregon and Washington now are the states like Michigan and Colorado that offer a assortment of things. So they have mail-in voting, but they also have vote centers on election day. And so voters have both options. So what we're kind of seeing is that the trend is that if you offer more options, but they're very specific, robust options, you don't just say like, well, you can have one week of early voting. Like they've got a full early voting program and a full mail-in voting program that people take advantage of it because they've got two really good options instead of several kind of lackluster ones. When you have mail-in voting, who pays the postage? Uh, in Missouri, for absentee ballots, we pay for the postage. So the county, the county, the county pays for the postage. Um, the state does often um, pay for some of the postage if you use their permit. Like they have a USPS permit that we can piggyback on, but we like our permit because it's local and it seems to work well. So we just factor that into the cost of the election. But what about In other that? states? Do you know? Uh, it is really dependent by state. Um, some people have to mail them on their own. Uh, some people, like military members in particular, we can give a postage paid envelope to our military people and to our overseas people, but that's not going to account for wherever they are located until it get, unless, unless they can take it to an embassy or it's only ever going to be in U.S. postage, they're going to have to pay some sort of postage to get it into the U.S. mail system. There's another question. Somebody raised their hand. But something like, um, I think, I think um, Montana as well as um, Washington State and Oregon also has write-in, in where they have a universal write-in only option. Do you know whether those states pay for the postage? Um. You may not know. I do not right. know. I do not know. I know when, when we're talking about having the state pay, pay for postage, um, it really depends on who is willing to kind of pass on those costs. So if the legislature makes an appropriation for it, but then the Secretary of State's office doesn't pass it on, or they come up with like in Missouri, for example, here is our permit. This is all that you can use. If you do not use our permit, we will not reimburse you. That's how it works in Missouri. So like, yes, we're required to pay for it. The state could just directly pay for it. They've chosen to do a permit, which works just fine for the majority of counties, especially small ones, because they'll just use the permit. They don't have much mail. We're sending out so much other mail, just makes sense to use our permit. Who decides what methods are used for um, how we vote? Uh, the state legislatures make the choices on how we can vote. So right now, the current law um, includes election day voting, two weeks of no excuse uh, absentee voting in person, six weeks of mail absentee if you have a reason for doing it. Uh, and that's really it. There is one little part of the law that says if you have a very small election, like less than 5,000 voters, and it's totally nonpartisan, and it's the only thing on the ballot, so like a bond issue in a very small town, it could be an exclusively male election. <laughs> That's the only time you can do an exclusively male election in Missouri. Uh, and sometimes people do it. There are smaller places that have done it because it's cheaper. It's like way cheaper if you're just having a small election to do that. And so sometimes the district that's putting it on the ballot will be like, yeah, go ahead. Um, CID is a great example of that, actually. So the community improvement districts, we have two of them, the Loop and then downtown CID. Those were ones that can be mail elections, and they've done mail elections for those. So there are some smaller ones. Um, and then anything that is not run by our offices. So the Missouri uh, Democratic primary that they just had, the presidential primary that took place on March 23rd. That had a in-person component to it, but it also had a full mail program where you automatically got a ballot if you were registered and you had an affiliation of Democrat. That's because it is a privately run election. 
And so they can make up all the rules that they want to and do their own thing. And the state law does not apply to them. So for those types of things, then they get to choose what they are. But for our offices, the only thing we can do is what the legislature tells us we can do. What is the policy right now on voting for people who are on probation in Missouri? So if you are on probation, uh, if you're serving a felony probation, then you can't register to vote or vote until you're finished with probation. Um, if you are serving probation on a misdemeanor, that's fine, you can vote. And uh, if you are in jail awaiting a sentence, that's fine, you can still vote. So it's when you're actively serving the felony. Is there any consideration for change of that? Because many of those probationers are working and paying taxes. Yes, there actually is. Um, the Missouri legislature has had several bipartisan bills that have been filed to um, try to get it so that as long as you're out of jail or prison, then you can vote. You can. You don't have to wait until you're done with probation. Just being out of um, incarceration is enough. And I feel like the tide might be turning in that direction where people are saying, yeah, that makes sense. Let's let's move that direction because um, it seems to make sense to everybody. But I don't know that it's going to happen this year. Any questions? Yes. I have a question that has, I don't want to say bothered me, but I've wondered about since I moved here from Pennsylvania. Why do we have so many elections? In Pennsylvania, you have the primary in May, and that's for every election, you know, everything, the local, state legislature, whatever, school board, everybody is on the ballot in May for the primary, November. That's it, unless somebody dies and you have a special election. But I just can't, I don't know if that would increase voter turnout if everybody showed up because every everybody has skin in the game because they want to vote for the mayor or they want to vote for the legislature or whatever. But, and I, how many elections did we have to roll parts? <laughs> so that is a great question too for the people on the um, Zoom. It's why, why does Missouri have so many elections? Uh, and we, I would say comparatively, we're probably in the middle of the road when it comes to the number of uh, elections. Some States like Pennsylvania only have a couple. Some states have them all the time. Um, uh, Michigan is one of them that has them all the time because they they can call special elections for certain things. Like ours, like for the situation where somebody gets written in and doesn't want the position, that doesn't result in an immediate election. It results in somebody filling the vacancy. In some states, that would create a new election. Um, so there has been some discussion in the legislature to consolidate. I think unwinding all of the tentacles of changing the election dates is really what's standing in the way of it right now, because the April elections, all of school district laws are predicated on the fact that they're April elections. Uh, city charters are based on there being April elections. And for most years, like odd numbered years, we only have one election and it's the April election. Um, but there have been movements to say, well, why don't we just make the one elections that happen every year in November? So then everybody's used to, we always vote in November. It doesn't matter what, whether it's an odd year or an even number year, you always have November. Uh, right now our situation is you always have an April. People don't even know we have an April in the first place. So I think that's something that will continue to be discussed in the legislature. What I see as um, one of the reasons why sometimes smaller offices don't want to be included in a consolidated election is because of down ballot drop off mm -hmm. and the phenomenon that people just stop voting after they get to the one they wanted. So I have, I think it would be really neat if we consolidated the elections, but all the local races were first. And so president was last, and you have to get to all of them in order to get to president. And I think that would be a really good way of doing it. California's kind of played around with that by putting things randomly, like their law says that you can move the, um, the ballot order around and things like that. 
And they're using that as sort of a test to see whether it does actually work or if it just, you know, has no impact on it. Another problem I could see trying to change it is whatever the terms are. I mean, you got yes. senators in six years and you got, you know, everybody. Uh, I don't know how Pennsylvania does it, but that's one thing when I moved here. Is, what do you mean? You got all these elections. <laughs> yeah, the, the terms are, um, it's not insurmountable to change the terms because we've done those kind of things before, but there would be like a, New York is actually in the process of consolidating their April. And so what they had to do was go to every one of the municipalities and say, okay, write up your plan for how you're going to be like adjusting to the fact that the terms change. Um, so it's doable and it is happening in other states. We'll see if it happens here. Um, what I know is going to happen is there will be more discussion about our presidential primary election, which was gone. And so if we bring that back, that's a fourth election that gets added into the mix in presidential years. So there's discussion about whether to just consolidate it with April so that there's only one or um, consolidate it with uh, other issues or just move it completely to a different time. When was it when we did it before? Was it on April? It was in March, but instead of being the first Tuesday of March, like elections are usually the first Tuesday of whatever month it is, it was the second Tuesday of March, which meant it was only three weeks away from the April election. Yeah. That's a lot of extra work. It's, it? it's extra work and voters get very confused because they're like, I just voted, why am I voting again? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to burn people out on elections either. Well, I don't think we're doing that right now at 13%. <laughs> Another way to increase voter turnout is by strengthening civic education. So that's, I mean, that's issues like this, but it's also strengthening it at the um, school level and bringing up kids. And that's one of the reasons we have a youth participant program to get kids interested and aware of how the process works so that they can be excited about it when they go to vote on election day instead of thinking that it is not something for them. Um, that's the, the kind of attitude that I have seen kind of permeating, especially among like teenagers and things like that is, well, like elections are not for me. That is something, you know, older people do and, you know, I'm not interested in it. Nobody does anything anyway. I'm not going to participate. And I think some of that is because of a uh, lack of foundation of understanding of how the different branches of government work and how you can get involved at your, at your local government level, especially, um, and how voting is one piece of that entire kind of network of being a civic participant. Oh, improve accessibility. Uh, this is another really good one that I think a lot of people don't take into consideration, and that's that when we look at the polling places, when we look at options for polling places, accessibility is very important because a place that may seem accessible to somebody that doesn't have some sort of disability may be a completely um, no-go. Yeah, the, the barriers may be way too high, and they may look at it and say, I can't, I can't go in there. Um, and so we do uh, surveys of the accessibility of our polling locations to make sure that if there are things that we need to change at the polling location, if it's so bad that we can't use it, then we know that. But uh, if there are things that can remediate stuff, like, oh, there's no uh, disabled parking here, we will send out another sign and then make disabled parking for the day. Uh, or if it's at one part of the building and that building has a really heavy door that people have a hard time opening, maybe we can move it to a different part of the building that has better flow. Um, so those are all considerations. And then uh, it also accounts for things like accessibility to the ballot in the first place. Um, so if it's hard to get a ballot, we in Missouri we have a permanent disabled list for absentee voting. So if you have a disability or you're homebound and you can never leave and that is never going to change, then you can have your ballot mailed to you. That is a valid reason to have your ballot mailed to you. And uh, that is not, it's in most of the states, things like that are in most of the states, but not all of them. So improving things like that, improving access and improving um, 
just general voter experiences so that everybody has the ability to participate, those are all helpful for increasing voter turnout too. Um, and I didn't put it on here, but the other thing that I think that happens, especially in Missouri, but I know in other states as well, when you see them in the news or you see uh, radical changes, like large changes to voter law, voter confusion is for me, for my opinion, not, not the office's opinion, but my personal opinion, voter confusion is the number one way that voter turnout is decreased mm -hmm. because it's too much for people to think about in their daily course of living, they're not going to scrutinize what kind of photo ID they have. They're not going to scrutinize whether they registered to vote in time or the deadline changed or I have this option or I don't really know because they hear things on the newspaper that contradict things that are on TV, that contradict what they see in social media, and they just say it's not worth it. It's like it, you've made it too hard, it's too confusing. Even if it's not hard and confusing. Even if the actual process is super easy and you can go vote and the reality of the situation is that they would be perfectly fine voting and there would be no problem if they went to a poll, the perception that everything is confusing and hard and changing all the time whips people up and prevents them from wanting to go turn out because they don't think it's worth their time. And that, unfortunately, is not something that we can fix, which is like a magic wand. But I think that if we can get to a place of uh, consistency and being able to have conversations about the actual details of how the process works instead of saying, like, we're making this rule because of this uh, this theory that exists or there's this law that's like litigation is happening or something, those are all the things that people just get confused about and then they don't want to turn out. Um, so if we can get to a better place than that, I feel like we will automatically see turnout increase as well. Yeah. This election, I, first time I was nervous about it because I wasn't sure whether my ID thing would work. And the reason being goes back. I'm old enough that when you, can, when you got married, you didn't have to legally change your name. You could start calling yourself slightly different, and that was accepted practice. I had my mother's maiden name, so I decided, and, and the practice was you dropped your own maiden name and used your maiden name for your middle name. So I would, if, and then when I got my last visa, uh, passport, I decided, well, really, my legal name is Susan Hilbert Murphy Telema. Well, that's a mouthful. <laughs> and when I came to Missouri, I, I had been using Susan M. Tillema. I, I, you know, I, legally I would write it out, but most of the time my signature was Susan M. But I would, I completely dropped the helper. When I came to the state and got my driver's license, he said, you're using your maiden name. I said, yes, but I was using my mother's maiden name before. And I, besides that, I don't want initials S-H-T. <laughs> so, <laughs> he let me use Susan Murphy Telema. So there for a while, I had Susan Murphy Telema on my driver's license and Susan Hilbert Murphy Telema on my... And then this last time, I changed my driver's license. And then I thought, oh, my God. My voter registration. I'm sure I'm Susan Murphy. <laughs> so will they let me vote? Yeah, and I that is a great example of um, there are a ton of studies for voter confusion in particular, and also just for impact on different law changes. Is that women are the ones that tend to get hit most by those types of changes because of all of the different protocols with name changes. And we had several calls on Tuesday of people saying, you know, I just got married, and so my name is what it was, but I registered to vote with my new name because I thought that I could, because you can, but my, but I haven't updated my ID yet, so what do I do? And so they changed their voter registration information to what matched their ID so that they could vote. Um, and they did that on that day? Yes. Yeah, you can oh, do a name yeah. change on that day, but, but those are all things that yeah, they're they're very confusing and they're hard to navigate. And 
without having, you know, like that law changed in 2022 and it's in litigation. And so maybe it changes again before November. Hopefully not, but maybe it does. Yes. Are there any laws in place to prevent voter intimidation on election day? So for voter intimidation laws, there are several election offenses. If someone actually is like harassing somebody, the general rule that addresses um, at polling locations is the 25 feet of electioneering. So electioneering, electioneering is not always harassment, but sometimes people get very zealous in their uh, electioneering. And that can be anything from being a petition circulator to being an actual candidate that's just breeding voters. That all has to happen outside of a 25 foot zone outside of the polling place door. So that way people can't just stand at the polling place and tell people whatever they want to tell them. Um, that's one of the smallest zones in the country. Most places have like a hundred feet of a zone. So that by the time that you get to your poll, uh, they don't, they, there is not much of an appetite to change that. We've been trying, the County Clerks Association has been trying to change that for a long time to get it outside of 25 feet. But um, candidates really like that it's 25 feet. Okay. And so there's always a lot of pushback when we go to the legislature and ask because um, especially for the polls uh, in places that are near like a busy street, 100 feet, maybe the middle of the road. And so they don't like that idea. So I don't know that we'll ever see that change, but that's usually what people rely on to say, well, you can't harass people as they're walking into the polls. If I wanted to give people rides to the poll, uh, do I have to check? Can I do that officially? Is there some official slot for that, or is it just a citizen action? Yeah, if you want to give people rides to the polls, there are organizations that do it, but people can just do that. Um, the things to keep in mind are that all the electioneering rules apply, and so the election offenses are things like, um, you know, you can't pay somebody to vote a certain way. You can't um, threaten them to vote a certain way. So if you're driving somebody, you know, you can have casual conversations about things, and that's that's totally fine. Um, volunteers, I think, organize rides to the polls for pretty much every election. And we are happy to, like, we know who is offering them. If we get somebody that calls and says, like, I can't make it, and I hear that somebody is offering rides, we have no problem telling them, like, well, so-and-so said that they're offering rides. Why don't you call them up? Who enforces the 25 foot? I mean, do you call? Do you notice somebody that's... Yeah, so uh, the 25 foot rule for electioneering, and somebody mentioned online too, uh, it's also not allowed to wear campaign clothes in the polling location because that is electioneering as well. Um, and that's not... That's also within the 25 foot zone. We have the poll workers put the, the cones out there, and then if somebody is uh, complained about, for lack of a better term, usually what happens is the voter comes into the poll and says, hey, you know that guy's like right beside the door and he shouldn't be. Then the election judges can ask them to go outside of that zone. If there are repeat offenders, then the office gets involved. Uh, we don't have the judges take on somebody that clearly is interested in violating the rule. Um, and then the other time where it gets a little tricky is outside of the 25 foot zone. It's up to the property owner of the polling place to decide whether somebody can be on that property or not. So if, for example, we are voting in a church that is a privately owned place and the administrator of that church does not want yard signs or people circulating petitions or candidates, then um, we will get involved if they have, if they told us in advance, and that's really easy because we can just say that can't be out there. If it happens in the course of the day because no one's ever tried to do it before and they now realize like, oh, I don't want that happening, then uh, usually I'll jump on the phone with whoever the person is out there and just say, if you don't want anybody out there, that's fine. They just need to know it's an all or nothing. They can't pick and choose which signs are out there. <laughs> Is there any firearm intimidation law restrictions? There is a restriction that you cannot have a firearm at a polling location. 
um, unless you're law enforcement and you're carrying it. That means within the 25 feet area or out of the parking lot? Um, I believe the law just says within the polling place. So there's not one there. Um, if there were intimidation that was happening, like with a firearm, the other laws of like not brandishing a weapon, because that's still occurring to like brandish a weapon, uh, those would all still apply. And those are things that we have built good relationships with our law enforcement for. If something like that were to happen, they are more than willing to go out and make sure that it is addressed. But they can't, like the election law itself, not just like public safety laws, say that you cannot have a firearm in the polling place. Oh, here's a here's a good question, um, and it is related to the April election. Um, and this is uh, this is something that I did, and <laughs> I got a lot of questions about it. And then I thought, hmm, I guess we haven't done that before. Overvotes and undervotes. Did anybody notice when you looked at the election night results that undervotes and overvotes were on them? They're still on them if you go look on the unofficial election results. So overvotes and undervotes, we sort of talked about in the election equipment world. Uh, but what it means is that a voter either didn't fill out all of the bubbles for which they were eligible to cast a vote for, that's an undervote. So for a school board race, for example, you can pick two. If you pick one, one is a valid vote. The other one is an undervote because you didn't pick one for that one. So that automatically makes it an undervote. If you don't fill it out at all, two undervotes. If you fill out all three of the people that are running for office, you have overvoted because you weren't able to vote for three people. You were only able to vote for two. Where the voting machines are very handy is that when you put a ballot in the machine that has an overvote on it, it says, whoa, 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 you're not going to have your ballot invalidated for that race if you don't fix it. Like the rest of your ballot will be fine, but if you made that mistake on one of the races, like that, it's not going to count. Your vote's not going to count in it at all. Um, do you want to fix it? And it gives you the chance to take your ballot back because it hasn't been counted yet. It's just sitting like in the tray. And you can take it back and ask for an election judge to spoil it, and you can vote again because you've made a mistake. Uh, Overvotes, when they make it all the way to an election night result, means that the voter had the opportunity to do it, and they just said, nope, I'm going to cast it anyway. I liked all three of them, and I wanted them all to know that. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's a thing that happens sometimes. Now, normally, we don't have that on our election night results. It is a setting that we have, and I clicked that setting. <laughs> when we did it this time, and I did get a lot of questions for it, but I think that it actually ended up being a very educational <laughs> opportunity because a lot of the candidates asked about it too. It's not great for candidates' egos because you can see how many people would prefer to not vote for you at all than vote for you, especially if you're the only candidate on there um, because you can see like, well, you know, 50 people voted for me, and then there were 75 undervotes. <laughs> like, 75 people would prefer not vote for me at all than vote for me as the only candidate. Um, but that, that is what undervotes and overvotes are. They're just a function of however many votes you're eligible to cast. So it looks really big in a school board election. You'll see, like, 3,000 undervotes. And it's not because 3,000 people didn't vote. It's because every voter, every single voter gets two votes. And so if you don't fill it out at all, you are two under votes. But if you skip, like sometimes I have skipped an office because I don't know either the candidates and I don't want to just vote for one because I like their name or something. So if I skip that, yeah. my ballot would still go through, but just it would be undervoted for that. Correct. Yes. So every every ballot, um, every issue on a ballot is a standalone issue. So just because you overvote or undervote on one thing does not mean that it affects all the rest of them. Anything else about Tuesday's election? Did it just go so awesome when everybody had great time? <laughs> I can tell you it was very quiet in the office all day. 
which is nice, but uh, hopefully we will have more excitement in August and November. Well, it was cold and rainy. It was cold and rainy. Yeah. Is it difficult to go into the schools and and have a class like yours to set pared down to teach these kids some civics? Um, you know, we've been. I think the mock elections for. So the question was, is it difficult to get in the schools to do civic education? And I think for the things like mock elections, those have been a little easier to get an entry point. And then there's days like uh, Constitution Day in September where they do a um, concerted effort to bring in like lawyers or people that work in First Amendment spaces and things like that. So we've had the opportunity to get involved that way. When it comes to actual curriculum, it's way harder. And so we try to provide supplemental things. So if a teacher wants to do something about voting that day, we can provide them with information or um, supplement, you know, like give them I voted stickers, which we've done with uh, some scouting groups and things. Like scouts, if need to get a badge, they have to do something related to civics. And so they'll make their own little mock election and then we'll give them stickers to hand out so they can get real live voted stickers and that's worked out really well too. So I, I I like to think of us more as kind of a supportive role in that. But I would really like to see more um, more defined ways that we could get some civic education in. I think it's just really hard with curriculum requirements right now. Somebody asked in the chat, who does the adjudication when a ballot is spoiled? So a spoiled ballot is accounted for. We have the um, the judges spoil a ballot at a poll, which a ballot might be spoiled at a polling place because a voter asks them to spoil it because they screwed it up and they want a new one. Or if a ballot is just left, uh, there's a surprising number of people that just like leave their ballot on the table and walk out. And at that point, you can't do anything with that ballot. It can't be counted. Yeah. So it gets spoiled. Um, the judges at the polling place will spoil it. We have a spoiled ballot bag that all the spoiled ballots go into. They write on the checklist at the end of the night. There's a poll closing certificate form. They write how many ballots were spoiled during that day so that we can match the number they say they have with the number that's in their little envelope. Um, and then. Those are saved, they're retained for 22 months, just like all of our other election materials. But there isn't anything that happens to them because they're spoiled. So at that point, they're accounted for because we don't want to have just ballots that aren't accounted for, but they can't be used for anything. Any other questions? A lot of good questions today. Yeah, that was my last one. We're lucky to have you. You had a question? Well, I'm thinking, husband and wife, but other parents, too, are just friends, go in, and they're there voting next to each other, and they're communicating. Is that an issue? Yes, they should not be doing that. <laughs> I know they shouldn't, but they do. That, right, so... It's hard to detect. Right, it is. Um, so the line of electioneering at a polling place, if somebody is having a conversation very loudly and disruptive and other people can hear, then that is when, like, I'll just tell you what we train our judges on. And it is that if they're, if it is very noticeable that they are having that conversation and there's other voters in the room, you tell them, hey, you really can't discuss that right now. It's one of the reasons we have uh, signs up that say you can't talk on the phone. Um, you can use your phone to look things up in research, but you can't call your friend and say, remind me who I was going to vote for again, like, who do you vote for, uh, which happens sometimes. And we have people come into the office that way, too, that they come in and they're talking about how they were planning to vote, and we have to remind them of that, too. If it is quiet, like they're the only people in there, and they're just having a conversation, and you know they're talking about the ballot, but you also know that like no one else is listening to them because there's nobody else to influence in there, then you just really get them out of there as quick as you can before that happens. If somebody walks in, you should go over and tell somebody. And this relates to this other question, which is, can a voter help another voter read the ballot? 
because you can run into electioneering that way. Yes, a voter can help uh, somebody else or even a non-voter. If you're not planning to vote but your friend is, you can go help them. Um, but Missouri law says you can only help that one single person. So you bring a person that's going to help you fill it out. Um, they can read the ballot to you and tell you can tell them how you want your ballot filled out. If you don't have a person with you, you can still ask the election judges to help you. And they do that in a bipartisan team to make sure that nobody is doing the wrong thing. Yes? This is sort of an anecdotal question. Every presidential election, it seems like Atlanta is, is a real focal point and there is 10 and 12 hour lines both parties blame the other party. What is it? You're not know talking about you picked up one out the Yeah, Georgia Georgia elections. Why does that happen? Every president's election or this these ten hour lines, how would that why does that keep happening? I think so the question is about why there are so many lines in Atlanta, um, Georgia specifically, but the um there's a couple reasons why I think from talking to people that administer elections in Georgia. And one is that uh, there are, in some places I think there's like capture of the political climate there and there's not much that can be done about it. Even if an election administrator is like, hey, it's really gonna help cut down the lines if we do X, Y, and Z, they're overseen by an elected board. So it's not like, in Missouri situation where I'm the county clerk and I'm elected and then I just make the determination and then convince the commission to fund that. So the they, state? No, well, they have a state one, but they have a secretary of state's office, but they also have um, a local commission that has to approve things like where their polling locations are going to be and how they're gonna run the election. They basically have to submit their plan for the election to this board before they are allowed to go do it. And if the board says, no, you can't do that, then they have to go back to the drawing board and start over. So some of it, I think, is just the political tension in those uh, administrative things in, in Atlanta. Um, and then some of it, I think, is just uh, the resources that they have. So the Georgia Secretary of State's office buys all of the equipment for every jurisdiction. And Atlanta doesn't get a say in that. They just get whatever it is that the Secretary of State's office gives them, and then they have to make it work. So um, some of it is outside of their control. Some of it is within their control. Um, and then some of it, I think, is just that there's a lot of really new elections administrators in Atlanta, specifically in Fulton County and things like that. They have gone through so many election directors that they haven't had one that has years and years and years of experience because of the political climate and like, it's just hard to hire people. So we're losing a lot of elections administrators in general. Georgia is a high number of them. Um, Michigan's a high number, Pennsylvania's a high number. Missouri, we've been okay. We've had uh, over a third of our people turn over. So in Missouri in, 20, in November, it'll be the first presidential election for a third of the counties for that county clerk to run that election. Um, and I think piggybacking off that Atlanta comment, somebody asked um, long line, the relationship between long lines and mail voting. I think that mail voting may have been introduced as sort of a way to help alleviate the lines. Uh, but it's another situation I think of in one of the earlier conversations we had about how people um, psychologically get used to voting. And so like, are you used to voting on a touch screen versus are you used to voting by mail? Or are you used to early voting? Georgia has early voting lines the entirety of the time they have early voting. And then not very many people have lines on election day. So if you look at what was happening on election day, there really weren't that many lines, but there were plenty of lines in early voting because people chose to early vote. And so nobody was mad about the lines during early voting because the voters got the chance to make the choice to stand in those lines. When people were getting upset, it was standing line on election day because that was the only opportunity they had to vote. So I think some of those things play into it as well. Um, 
if you have a culture of early voting and you have a bunch of people that don't mind standing in lines, then lines aren't necessarily a problem. But if you are looking at election day, everybody's going to be mad about lines on election day. And that's kind of the, the trade-off, too, when people say, well, I don't want my polling place to move because my polling place here moves from April to November. And yes, because we're trying to make sure that there are fewer than a thousand people that are going to be turning out so that you don't have to stand in a line. If you'd like me to keep your same polling location with 4,000 people assigned to it and 3,000 people show up to vote at that location, you're going to be standing in line for several hours. So it's kind of the trade-off of how we want to do things. And I think Atlanta is big enough, they just see that problem scaled up as well. And then they have political pressure to not fix it the way they want to, but the way they have to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brianna, thank you. It was an excellent class. We appreciate your time again. Thank you.